Welcome to this episode of Robots in Depth. Today I'm honored to have Peter Cork from Queensland University of Technology and uh, computer vision is your thing. How did you get started in robotics? So my first job after I graduated, uh, I did electrical engineering at the University of Melbourne and I got a research assistant job in that same school. And it was a control systems lab and I think maybe it was the second year I was there, we had a, un a university open day was coming up and we wanted to have something that was a bit sort of visual and interesting to show parents and potential future students coming through. And this was a long time ago, this is probably 1983 or something like that. So we bought a little robot, uh, five axis robot with stepper motors in it. And that was, that was pretty cool. We bought that and I connected it to a computer which was uh, in the day we call a mini computer. So it's a great big rack of stuff and interface the two. This was an LSI 11, uh, which is kind of my, my, still my favorite computer ever, <laughs> and wrote a whole bunch of software. And I'm th thinking it was probably written in Fortran. Uh, and anyway, played a game of checkers. Mm. So this little robot just sort of sat on the side of a checkers board and someone would make their move. And I think I'd have to type that in on the terminal and then the robot would make its move and, and so on. So we're talking 1983, so you need to lower your expectations a bit. But it but was- still, it was a robot playing chess, right? It was a, not chess, it was checkers. Ah, checkers, uh, okay. Which is, a, which is a simpler game. Mm -hmm. uh, and it did very simple manipulation and picked the pieces up and, and all of that. So you know, I was pretty, pretty happy with, uh, with that and, and how it went. Really my first exposure to robotics and kinematics and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. And then sometime, not long after, there was an advertisement in the newspaper uh, for Australian Federal Research Organization, uh, an organization called CSIRO, and they were looking for a roboticist. And you know, they were just like five blocks away from the university where I was working. So I applied and I got that job and I stayed there for 25 years. And during that time, then we did a whole bunch of different robotics projects. Started in manufacturing robotics and the first project there was concerned with deburring. So that's where you have a robot with a grinding wheel and you're trying to take the rough edges off a piece of metal. And that's pretty challenging because most robots are position controlled and to do deburring, you need to use force control. So we're trying to do force control, but we've got a grinding wheel on the end of the robot and that's injecting a ton of noise into the force sensors. And so yeah, it took, there was a lot of signal processing, control engineering to get a, a Puma robot holding a very small grinding tool and, and to grind metal. Mm -hmm. so very advanced for, for because we're again, we're talking in mid 80s here, right? Correct. Uh, so that's quite an advanced, as you say, the noise there in that signal has to be horrible. Huh? Yeah, it is. It is pretty horrible. So and there was absolutely, there was a lot of filtering in that. And the robot had to be able to react very quickly to changes in force. So the, the Puma robot came with a control box and the Unimate controller and the vowel programming language and all of that. So yeah, we stripped all of that away mm -hmm. and we developed our own uh, robot control architecture. So again, at this time we were experimenting with very uh, early 32-bit microprocessors. So uh, National Semiconductor 32,000 series and then 68,000s, 68020s. And then they came out with floating point units. Ooh, and that wow. <laughs> and we're talking probably a 16 megahertz processors, you know, mm. with a few megabytes of RAM. Mm. Uh, Very hard to do <laughs> such a hard problem in such a constrained environment. Huh? Absolutely. So, you know, we wrote everything from, you know, schedulers all the way, all the way up. This code was probably all written in C uh, mm. at, at this stage. And, you know, we wrote kinematic modules and for, for the inverse kinematics and simple trajectory planners very influenced at that time by a, a software package called RCCL, mm -hmm. uh, which was developed at, uh, in initially at University of Pennsylvania, and, uh, and, then, and then later in, in other places, we sort of built a, a sort of more modular, more portable version of that. We call it ARCL, and attempted to open source that. A couple of people used it, I think, but it didn't have a, have a particularly big big impact, but it was a good enough tool for us to, to be able to do our work. And the other thing that was happening at that lab at the same time as, as we're doing this uh, force control work, there was another group of people who were looking at doing very high speed image processing. So you take a, a video stream and then you threshold it 
So you get a binary image stream. And then we want to be able to describe the binary objects in the scene. So this is very simple blob vision. And so they are starting to develop some custom uh, microchips that would do this blob processing in real time. So that seemed like a cool project. So I, I hung out with them for a bit and got very, very much involved in, in that project. And the result of that was this big VME bus card with custom chips on that, uh, semi-custom and, and, and full custom ICs. So I got a little bit involved in, in, in that sort of stuff. I haven't really ever touched that again since. But what it did is it would take a, a stream of video from a camera and it would produce an interrupt every time uh, a blob in the scene was complete. And then it would tell you its oh. area, its perimeter, its first and second moments. And mm. from that, you could say something about its shape. Mm. But it gave me the ability to process visual information 25 frames a second with very, very low latency. Mm. And being a control systems guy, I thought, well, that's kind of cool. So I could actually use that to close the loop on the robot. Mm. Uh, so... You know, it's at 20, 25 hertz. That, that's good enough to close a loop on a robot. Mm. And so that's when I got interested in this whole area of vision-based vision -based control. So I took the technology really from these two projects uh, and brought them together and demonstrated. I initially demonstrated, certainly demonstrated closed loop performance, but initially the performance was pretty lousy. Uh, it was very laggy, very, actually the closed loop bandwidth was very, very poor. And... I did some of this work when I was on a, a fellowship at the University of Pennsylvania. That was 1988, 89. And then looking at how well it did from a control systems perspective, I was unhappy with the closed loop performance. I went back to, when I went back to Australia, I embarked on a PhD because I didn't have a PhD previously. Anyway, so I started PhD and the topic of that was the dynamics of closed loop visual control systems. So then looked at much more sophisticated controllers, looked at predictive control, and there's a prediction that's really, really important because by the time a camera sees something and the image is transmitted from the camera into the computer and then it's processed and you get a result, even if you use all this cool hardware in between, there's still quite a delay. Mm. So the robot is always reacting to what was rather than what is. Mm. So the only way you get around that is to then have models of how things are moving in the world, predict where the thing would be in the nearest future mm. and react to that rather than the old information that's coming from the sensor. Very, very uh, interesting that that you, you trying to look at the image, not only interpret the image, which I found mind bogglingly hard, but also trying to do if an object is moving in a tra trajectory in the image, it is safe to presume that it might continue to do so. That's right. And you have to use you know, pretty strong assumptions here about how the object will move into, into the future. But I think we do this. Uh, you know, our whole ability to play any kind of sport that involves dynamic objects, uh, the ability to catch something, mm. really relies on us having a, an internal mental model of the dynamics of moving objects. And we've got a lot of delays in our uh, visual processing system and our motor control system. And so, yeah, we absolutely couldn't function unless we were able to do prediction. And I think you could argue that perhaps one essential capability or, or capability requirement of intelligence is really to be able to reason about the world, not just as it is now, but as it will be into the short term future. Depending on what you <laughs> see and what you've seen, you can predict the future. Absolutely. And I, and I think that's critical to what goes on in here. This is in large extent a, a prediction engine about what will go on in the future. And if what you predict comes to be, then you pay it no heed. Mm. Uh, but if what you predict to happen doesn't happen, you are surprised, mm. you have a learning moment, and then you know, your skill changes. Mm. And then your next prediction will be better. Absolutely. There is also so that in this world, tennis balls just don't change trajectory mid-air without hitting anything. So there are many contexts where we actually can tell how an object is going to behave. Absolutely, and I think this is the thing that's really important about robotics. Robot, robots, devices that are embodied in the physical world. Uh, the, the law of physics applies to their motion, but also to the motion of everything that's around them. So in computer vision, a lot of the effort goes into trying to interpret you know, a particular image. Yeah. Uh, 
in a robot, yes, we may need to interpret a particular image, but then we need to interpret the next image and the next image and the next image. There's not going to be very much difference from one image to the other. So it's not like we have to process a thousand images in a row that are all completely different. We have this temporal continuity in the, the sensory perception that's coming to the robot. And that, I think, is you know, it's critical about robotics. We can rely on mm, mm, temporal dynamics and, and, um, and physics. You can look at the image and see what changed and maybe focus on that. Absolutely. You can, if there's something of interest in one frame, and you can be pretty sure where it will be in the next frame, mm. uh, and then you just have to process those, those particular pixels there. Mm. So although you might argue that to process one image is hard, mm. and to process a stream of images is going to be a lot harder, mm. actually I think it's simpler to process the stream, the stream of images. And the quicker you, t you take those images, the shorter the inter-frame time, mm the less difference there is from frame to frame and actually that interpretation becomes easier. Mm. So it's somewhat unintuitive that to process a stream of images that come at you at a really high rate, that processing problem is actually not so hard mm. on a frame by frame basis. And especially if you want mm. to, to separate an, an, an item from a background, for instance, because if the, if, if the robot is stationary or you can predict the robot's motion because it knows how it's moving it, its own body, and, but the, this object that is moving, uh, you could discern it from the background by simply saying, OK, this is a blob that's moving. With and the other blobs, yeah. yeah, and the other blobs are standing, not maybe necessarily still, but they're moving in a predictable way depending on how I move, right? Yeah. But you know, one of the, the, the limitations of this early work we did was, uh, was this blob vision where you segment the world into objects and not objects, mm -hmm. you know, white things against the black background. Mm -hmm. And that was probably acceptable in the 80s when we were struggling with all manner of problems. That was sort of a nice simplification to be able to make. But you know, where visual perception has always struggled is how do we deal with much more complex, much more realistic worlds uh, and you know, vis visual scenarios? And, you know, and how do we deal with the fact that you know, as the lighting changes, you know, things look different, uh, certainly look different to a vision system. And it's really only the last few years, I think, that we've made a lot of progress using techniques like, like deep learning, uh, deep neural networks, to be able to quite robustly understand objects in the world, irrespective of lighting, irrespective, irrespective of the viewpoint uh, that we have. And that makes it very exciting that we've now got very robust perception. We know how to process information about where objects are, use that to control how robots move. So we've got l almost all of the pieces in place now, I think, to have robots that can robustly react uh, to, their, to their visual world. Hmm. We're talking here about images, and we haven't kind of defined. Uh, of course, this can be a, a visual image, like you and I see the world in, in kind of a color. Yep. But it could also be from, from heat uh, cameras. It, Absolutely. Is that also what you call an image, right? I, I'm probably not terribly consistent on, on this, but certainly you know, one of the most exciting sensors that's been on the roboticist land uh, toolkit mm -hmm. for you know, the last five m more years are these mm -hmm. so-called RGBD sensors. Mm -hmm. So it, for every pixel, they give you red, green, blue, and depth. Mm -hmm. So things like, uh, like the Connect sensor, mm -hmm. for instance, was really the, the first commercially available low-cost RGBD sensor. Mm -hmm. And that provides very, very rich information. Mm -hmm. Sadly, it doesn't work very well outdoors, where mm. there's a lot of infrared illumination from the sun, mm. but it works adequately in an indoor environment. And having that depth information is really important to a robot, because if you've got the depth information about a scene, you can reconstruct the geometry. Mm. And most robot problems are posed in terms of geometry. Mm. I have well, an object that's that. got a pose, uh, the robot arms got a pose, and you want to make the pose of the end of robot's end effector move toward the pose of your object. It's all geometry. And RGBD sensors give you that directly. And mm. so do so do LIDAR sensors. Mm. I guess what's always intrigued me is the fact that we can do these problems. I can guide my hand to pick up an object just using my eyes. Mm. And my eyes are a pair of projective cameras, mm. effectively RGB cameras. Mm. And we're able to do fantastic uh, Ge geometric reconstruction, depth Catching estimation. A flying by us. Absolutely. And we can do it not just statically, but we can do it dynamically. And you know, these are very uh, 
I won't say these are cheap sensors, <laughs> uh, but cameras mm -hmm. that can sense RGB uh, pixel values are, are very, very low cost. Mm -hmm. uh, they cost probably in the, the quantity that somebody like Apple mm -hmm. buys them and puts them in, in, uh, in phones, they probably cost only a couple of dollars each. Mm -hmm. So if we look at the, cap the visual capability that we have and mm -hmm. that almost all organisms have, mm -hmm. it's phenomenal. Mm -hmm. uh, we can do all of these things just using a pair of cameras. Uh, what we don't think about so much is the one third of our brain, uh, the back third, the visual cortex, which is doing amazing processing of that raw visual information and you know, turning that into information, act actionable information. Mm. So Sharing our, that with the rest of the brain. Yeah. So our eyes are probably uh, you know, 100 megapixel sensors each, mm. very, very high dynamic range. Mm. But we've got half a kilogram of, uh, of gray matter mm. at the back of half our heads. A uh, it consumes six watts mm. and it's able to process very complex scenes, work out how far away things are, can recognize faces, mm. do, as you say, the visual prediction that I, and that allows me to catch the tennis ball. Mm. Uh, all of that for six watts. Mm. That's the amazing thing. We're doing great things now in vision uh, by throwing GPUs at the problem mm. and they're, they're chewing down hundreds of watts mm. of, of electrical power. Uh, and they're you know, not 600 grams either. No. Uh, so they're, and they're very far away from the same capabilities, right? Yeah. But I think we're starting at least to be able to create algorithms that can solve these problems. The way we do it is perhaps crude compared to the way uh, evolution has solved the problem for us. Mm. But once we've got a handle on what are the right algorithms, then I think we'll come up with better computing architectures that will execute those algorithms mm -hmm. in you know, low weight, low cost, low, low dollar cost, and, and, uh, and low, low power cost. Mm. So I think that will all come. The other area I think that is a reason to be, to be kind of excited at the moment is there's you know, a couple of very big projects looking at the way the human brain is structured. It's a big project in Europe, big project in the, in the US, using a lot of new technology to basically be able to map you know, the neural structure of our brain. And so as we do that, it'll give us some insights too into the way we're wired and maybe we'll learn about some of the tricks that we use to solve these very, very tricky problems. Mm. So interesting, really interesting times. Uh, the fact that we, you know, computer scientists are coming up with fantastic algorithms. We've got great hardware, uh, GPU hardware coming out from companies is getting better and better. Mm. And we've got other sorts of scientists trying to understand how we work. Mm. And then we combine that. Absolutely. So we're so next, next five, 10 years, uh, th uh, I think we'll, we'll make great progress. Mm. And we, 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 we might also come to this critical point of where we are actually able to put these system into robotics out there and then get all that feedback from them used in the field. Uh, and actually providing use. Uh, do you think we're close to that deviation point where we can use vision-based systems? I would like to say we're very close to that and the center that I'm the director of, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's our mission is to be able to equip robots with a sense of vision. Uh, our, our tagline is creating robots that see mm. because we believe that until robots can see as competently, competently or better than we can, a whole lot of jobs that we do effortlessly will not will be out of reach of robots. Mm. So until yeah, they, they, they've got the similar perceptual capability, uh, that they won't be able to do the work we want them to do. No, I am totally with you there. I, I am the sa absolutely the same thing. The eye and the hand are the key for robotics for the future, for many applications anyway. Yeah. Uh, both today are very limited. Robots don't see well enough and they don't they aren't dexterous enough. Yeah. And here's an interesting uh, sort of example was given to me by, by one of my colleagues. Consider the problem of chess. Mm. You know, chess was once considered, you know, the pinnacle of human intellectual achievement or, or capability. And then we were able to beat uh, or computers were able to beat best human chess player more than a decade ago, mm. maybe two decades ago. I, I can't remember exactly mm. when yeah, it was. Long time ago. Yeah. Uh, and everyone said, well, you know, that's it. Uh, yeah, we're done. But really, you think about the, the problem of chess. Okay, we can solve 
the algorithmic problem of chess. But, you know, a, a two-year-old child can pick up a chess piece. Mm. And I think robots are still not able to pick up a chess piece on a, on a cluttered board very quickly mm. or very reliably. Mm. And then you've got the perception problem. Mm. You could, I'm not sure now we could come up with a very robust vision system that could tell you the state of the board for any kind of chess set. You know, mm. if I gave a chess set mm. you'd never seen before and gave it to you and asked you to pick up the white queen, mm. you would you just reach over and pick it up. Mm. Although I've never seen it before. Correct. And it doesn't look like a queen. Yeah, but mm. you'd be able to figure it out, mm. partly on its appearance and partly you'd be able to know what you know about chess mm. and that there's only one queen, probably the tall piece. Mm. Uh, with relationships to the yeah. other. It's not one of the small that there are many of. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah you, that kind of high level reasoning. And I think we can't do that. I, I think w we would struggle to come up with a system that could read a chess board that had never seen before and, uh, and indicate which was that particular piece and then have a robot come over and pick that up and move it. Mm. So it's funny that we consider chess a solved problem. Mm. The algorithmic part is, mm. but the manipulation and the vision part is not. The general public uh, that don't quite understand the difference between artificial intelligence and robotics, uh, they are re related in, in many particular ways, but to my mind, artificial intelligence is the, the disembodied mm. intelligence, where robotics is that intelligence embodied and interacting with the physical world, sensing the physical world, manipulating the physical world, mm. and those things are really hard, yet you know, we've, we're pre-wired at birth to be able to discover the abilities to, to do that. Uh, we're st struggling to get robots to do that, though last few years, fantastic progress uh, in deep learning. And at this particular conference, we've seen great results in you know, deep learning for understanding scenes and also for manipulation. Mm -hmm. And I also think since we are so good and we learn uh, we train our hardware, we're born with the hardware, and then we train them yep. at the time where we're not self-reflective. We have a hard time relating to why does robots have such a hard time doing this? This is simple. Mm. Because we don't remember the six or ten years we spent learning to do it ourselves. No, and we we're don't. born with amazing hardware to start with, right? So here we have a robot that has inferior hardware, and it is two months old because it hasn't had this enormous growth period that, that a human have. So. But the sad thing is that every single human has to, has to go through that learning phase. Mm, mm. Uh, it's not the case for robots. Only one robot needs to go through the learning phase and then it can share its learning with, with, uh, with all the other robots. Mm. And if one of those other robots has a surprise where what it's learned doesn't gel with reality, mm. it's gonna have uh, an increment of learning and, the, and they can share that with all of the other robots. So collectively, the population of robots is going to be able to learn at, at, a, at a phenomenal rate. Mm. Uh, we need to understand how to represent the learning, mm. what it is that they have as a representation of the world and the skills that they need to interact with the world and perceive the world, and then how that would be communicated. Mm. And I'm not sure anyone's looking at that problem just yet. So that's sound, fascinating. They it is even, fascinating. It they, sounds a little flaky and it sounds a little scary, Terminator-like. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, they can even share each other sensors. They can determine I'm here to perform my task. I need to know what's going on over there. My sensors aren't uh, good enough where I'm, there's something in the way or something like that. And they can say, but you you're over there. Could you share my? Could you share your image with me and I can have a look. <laughs> Humans can't do that. If you're around the corner and I need to see what you see, you have to take a picture and send it to me. But robots can share that with more lag. But anyway... Not, necess not necessarily more lag, but I think this is an, an interesting point you raised, that we have this, I guess, anthropomorphic view mm. of sensors being wired to our brains. Mm. And they all are. All our tactile sensors, all our eyes mm. are wired to our brains. Mm. So your, your eyes are completely useless to me as, yeah. a, as a resource. So one of my PhD students is looking into this problem and you know, the use case we have is blind robots navigating around uh, an environment mm. and they just make a request for views. Mm. You know, anyone near me, 
can give me a view of what's going on. Mm. But not just sending the images, we're actually, the cam cameras are doing some processing and saying, you know, show me where's some clear space. Can you see me? Can you see which direction it is that, that I should go? And if uh, we, we were doing it, say I was a robot and you were a robot and we're doing a task and I need to see what was around the back. We might just get some features that were coming from your eyes mm -hmm. and fold them into my algorithm with the features coming from my eyes. And if that wasn't enough, there was another robot over there. Say, so come over here, you know, tell me what you see. And, and, and then and we immediately, can do it. Yeah, yeah that, that's spooky. As you say, it's a little bit low. Whoa. <laughs> but that's because we relate to ourselves. I mean, yes. that's spooky for us. It's going to be common, like standard for robots, right? Yeah, I, I think it's just we're not thinking sufficiently laterally when it comes to, to sensing resources that they don't have to be, I don't have to own the eyes. Mm. As long as I've got mm. access to the eyes mm. uh, to help me do the job, mm. that, that's, that's enough, mm. yeah. But the other thing, I, I worry, you look at a lot of these drones and they all have you know, gimbal mechanisms to stabilize the camera and, I, and a gimbal is a slow, heavy, mechanical thing and mm. I really wonder why we don't just plaster a whole bunch of very uh, lightweight cameras fixed, mm -hmm. just pointing in a whole bunch of different directions, mm. and then post hoc mm. uh, warp out, you know, the stable image that you that you want. The one thing uh, that I have learned of recently that really surprised me are consumer grade cameras, which are able, which have got phenomenally high ISO ratings. Mm. So ISO rating fifty thousand. Mm. So you can take it out and dark. Into, you might be pitch black, you can't see anything. And these cameras are forming images. They're a little, they're a bit grainy, a bit noisy, mm -hmm. uh, but it's a decent image that you can actually run feature detectors and, and, and so on on. So, and so Sony recently released a commercial camera with this very high ISO mm -hmm. rating, and I believe other Canon main, has. Canon has one. And you know, people are talking about cameras now with ISO ratings of millions. Yeah. Uh, and that's potentially a game changer. Uh, outdoor robots are going to need to function day and night. And as a community, I've always been a little bit amused by the fact that we just kind of ignored night. You know, we just pretend it doesn't exist. And we had an agricultural robotics project uh, running for the last few years at, at my university and we had to deal with the night problem mm. and we dealt with that very old school way we just put very bright lights mm. on the on the robot but engineering a, a decent light source that allowed stereo vision to work mm. you know five ten meters away from the robot uh, was pretty hard mm. and consumed a lot of power mm. and it was you know it was very very bright you know hurts your eyes if you get to get too close to it every bug in the area. So your vision is suddenly dealing yeah. with 10,000 flying things around it. Some of them glowing themselves, right? <laughs> you, uh, absolutely, so you, 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 have, you have that problem. Yeah. Uh, and, but you know, it's, it just, it's a very clumsy and, in, mm. and inelegant solution to, to the problem. You know, our eyes have got fantastic dynamic range. Mm. You know, we can get dark adapted if we wait mm. a quarter of an hour. You know, mm. our, the gain in our, in our eyes mm. uh, increases mm. through some very uh, slow chemical processes. Mm. So if robots could uh, just switch on uh, a night vision, yeah. that, would be, that would be fantastic. Yeah. And I see the same thing when I study cameras for this video project. I see that, uh, not cameras th that I need to use, but ISO steps up uh, half a stop, a stop every time somebody releases a new camera, yeah. giving you the equivalent image. As you say, for the highest, uh, higher ISOs, they're still, they're still not very good. But I've seen, uh, was it the 4 million ISO? Canon, ha and that's kind of not a consumer camera. It's still many thousands of dollars, mm. but, but it's, it, it, it exists. You can buy it on, over the, over yeah. the counter, uh, and it's just amazing what they can do. Yeah. And this is a capability uh, yeah, that probably once existed only in uh, you know, special forces had mm. access to that kind of night vision capability. Mm. So now it's in the professional camera market mm. and it will trickle down into the, uh, you know, the regular- Smartphone uh, market. In yeah, the, uh, maybe it'll be in your smartphone in, mm. in, in a few years time. Mm. Uh, and that, that's staggering. To me, that's the most surprising sort of sensory capability I've learned about in, mm. uh, in, in recent months. Yeah, very, very nice to hear. Mm. Uh, so this was amazing. We've learned so much about vision processing. Of course, I can recommend Peter's book. 
uh, if you say that you, you're not a university student, you're not a PhD or an undergraduate, you're maybe uh, a, a younger person going to high school, mm -hmm. how would you recommend somebody getting into the field of, 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 of computer vision? Of computer vision or, or robotics or both? Yeah, both actually. I mean, if you have a primer for the 15 year old or the the person that doesn't have a, because we want to bring in everybody into robotics and, and, and then they need somewhere to start. If you, you look at what's available o online and in the, in the book marketplace, mm -hmm. there is really sort of three, there's three categories. So there's a lot of uh, material aimed at the hobbyist. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, how do you build robots using Arduinos and RC servo motors and whatever. So those books are a lot about doing. Mm -hmm. You know, how do you take the tech and, and make it do something. And then there's at the graduate level, so mm -hmm. there, there are quite advanced textbooks with a ton of maths in them, mm -hmm. uh, which are going to be inaccessible to Most you know, the, the demographic that you, that mm -hmm. you specifically mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's a number of textbooks which are designed for university, university level. Mm -hmm. And you know, some of those are, tend to be quite quite theoretical, quite principled, have a lot of mathematical formalism in them. With, with my book, my book was designed for mid-undergraduates. Mid so someone in engineering, yeah. doing an engineering degree, maybe second year engineering. I tried to be pretty light on the, on the formalism. It's a very hands-on book. So it allows you just to, to write code uh, and experiment. And I think the best way to learn anything is by doing and it, it tries to take you, you know, by the hand and gently lead you through n just the minimal level of formalism to understand some of the concepts. Mm. So it introduces you to a lot of the algorithms in a hopefully fairly painless way. <laughs> That's what the, the book's about. So it's a, it's a very chatty book. Uh, it's more like it's quite conversational, doesn't try to be very formal, and it mixes mm. text with diagrams, with mm. pieces of code, mm. and, and really leads you through. Mm. Because it's, an, it's aimed at engineering students, mm. it may be beyond people who are still, say, in, in high school. Mm. But if you, know, you, you are in that, that demographic, you are in high school, you want to get into robotics, mm. Give it you a crack. Huh? Give it a crack. And you can't do robotics without the formalism. You need mm. to learn the math. Mm. So if you're going to get into robotics, learn the math. I'd like to think my book is probably one of the most painless ways, <laughs> ways in. Mm. Uh, so you need to know a little bit of linear algebra. You need to know about vectors and matrices. Mm. But if you understand vectors and matrices, then absolutely give it a go. Worst thing that can happen is you're not going to understand it. And then maybe you have to go off and you know look at some stuff on Khan Academy or. Uh, I was research. just about to mention yeah. Khan Academy, uh, and that's a great resource to it's get. It's a fantastic resource. Mm. It, it's uh, going to change the world. Yeah, it might change the world exactly uh, in the magnitude of robotics, actually, because it's going to be able to teach people the things that they need to then get access to your kind of material and then build robots. That's, yeah. And that's what we want to do. We want more people to be part of it. We want more people to do r robotics. And I, I, I am thinking this is great that your books exists and that you have this approach. Uh, so you can start with something simpler, building your um, robots from, as you say, more hobby grade stuff. Yeah. Then you can try your book out add a little bit of Khan Academy to that, and, and you're, you're way on the way to, to use computer vision in your robot. Absolutely. Yeah. But you know, you've got to be able to code. I think that, that's, mm. that's, you know, that's a fundamental message. Mm. You've got to be competent coding in mm. C++ or Python. Mm. Uh, you do that. Is Python fast enough for uh, vision processing in real time? Uh, there are libraries that work with Python. So OpenCV, for instance, which is a very, very, very well known. Mm -hmm. Uh, very complete uh, set of primitives for image processing has got really excellent Python bindings. So Great. you can you write in Python the underlying stuff's happening in C++ code yeah. under, under the hood. So you can start again. You can start using it in C++ in Python, and when you realize the library is not doing what you want, you can do that little piece 
and then you have to learn C or, or, or another language, but, but, but you can gradually go there rather than having to start there. Huh? Yeah, mm. and I think you look at almost all robotic systems, there's some, some mixture of C++ and, and Python coding. Mm. The, mm. the percentages will vary, but mm. if you've got those two, those two languages, you're, you're very well placed to, mm. to get into, into robotics. The other tool, if you get into robotics, you really need to know about is ROS, mm. and there's mm. quite a few good introductory books now for Ross. Mm. That didn't used to be the case. Mm. You just used to go to the website and do the tutorials. Mm. Now there's some really nice books that will, you know, again, take you by the hand mm. and help you on that, on that journey. Mm. Yeah. The two language thing, the C and the Python, as a programmer, I am definitely of the uh, opinion that that's the best way to go because to write all of it in C is overkill and it will make you less productive, yeah. but you cannot write some of it in Python, so you have to have both. Yeah, Python gives you the productivity. Yeah, and uh, C gets you. But the you're going to lose some performance, yeah. uh, and C++ is the converse. So yeah, mm. it it always comes down to some mm. some suitable mixture. Yeah, 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 yeah. So towards the end of this interview, we are going to go to the fashion hour. I'm going to ask you to show you our your, your very nice T-shirt here <laughs> because we're going to go to the. This this uh, this episode is brought to you by Ikra in Australia, two thousand and eighteen. And uh, Peter here is wearing the T-shirt. So, do you want to see the T-shirt? Yeah, that's the front I, of the T-shirt. Yeah, and that's the that's the back of the T-shirt. Look at that. So we did like a road show. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. We yeah, got yeah. the uh, the date and the location of uh, of every Ikra that 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 has happened. Yeah, yeah. So uh, now so you can add fashion model to your CV <laughs> next to professor. So yeah, 2000, 2018, uh, ICRA will be held in uh, my hometown, Brisbane, mm -hmm. uh, in Australia. Mm -hmm. uh, Brisbane is in the subtropics. Mm -hmm. So the conference will be held in May 2018. Mm -hmm. uh, so approaching winter mm -hmm. because we're in the Southern Hemisphere. Mm -hmm. We're in autumn, mm -hmm. uh, moving into winter. Mm -hmm. Very, very lovely season, lovely weather. Mm -hmm. uh, Brisbane is a, is, a, is a great city, mm. and I think it will be a, a wonderful conference. Mm. First one ever in the Southern Hemisphere. So in the whole history of Icarus, yeah, none, none has been in, in the Southern Hemisphere. Mm. Some of the big vision conferences have gone down under, mm. but, but not, not yet robotics. So mm. it's very time nice. is we're, near. We're very much looking forward <laughs> to it, and I hope to speak to you again then. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks very much, Pat. This episode is sponsored by Aptomica. Everything you need in modular robotics. For robots up close, what's going on in robotics, online and on the road. If you like this interview, don't forget to subscribe, follow us on Twitter and subscribe to our email newsletter on robotsindepth.com. You can also support the show on Patreon.